Well, hello again. In this example, you will see how to incorporate thermal loads within the matrix formulation. Specifically, we will be looking at this two-member beam. We are being told that the global and element stiffness matrices have already been given. We are being asked to use the matrix approach to solve for the joint displacements, reactions, and member end forces associated with the applied loading. And that applied loading not only includes this 10 kips, but also includes a thermal gradient on member number two. So take a look here. We're being told it's 50 degrees Fahrenheit on the upside of the beam, 120 degrees Fahrenheit on the bottom edge of that beam, and we're also being told that the beam depth in that region is 10 inches, and that will be used later on as we look at the... The first thing we need to do is label the degrees of freedom. We'll do the unrestrained degrees of freedom first, degrees of freedom one and two, and then the restrained degrees of freedom, three and four, five and six. And I'll show you this quickly. These are the matrices which have been generated using the units of kips and inches. Member number one has degrees of freedom three, four, one, and two. Member number two has degrees of freedom one, two, five, and six. These element matrices can then be combined into the global structure matrix and that would be given as such. We will go ahead and partition this matrix into the unrestrained and restrained degrees of freedom, noting that this matrix is the KUU matrix, and this matrix is the KRU matrix. So within the matrix formulation, we've got the stiffness matrices, but we are now in the process of generating the force vectors. This F sub U vector is a vector that is to contain the forces that are applied to the unrestrained degrees of freedom. So if we look back here, we see that there is a negative 10 kips in degree of freedom 1 and nothing being applied to degree of freedom 2. So we'll plug in here negative 10 kips and 0 kip inches for degree of freedom 2. However, we also need to impose the forces that are being generated due to that thermal gradient and the way we would do that is to come up with an equivalent set of forces that that thermal gradient generates for us. And the way that is done is by locking the degrees of freedom associated with that member and then calculating the fixed end shears and the fixed end moments that are associated with that. We have been told before that the only thing that really develops because of that thermal gradient will be these fixed end moments at the degrees of freedom and they are based on the temperature at the bottom of the member, temperature at the top of the member, the depth of the member, and also the coefficient of thermal expansion which was given to us earlier in the problem statement along with the properties of E and I. So for our particular case we have a top temperature of 50 degrees Fahrenheit, a bottom temperature 120 degrees Fahrenheit. We have a depth here of 10 inches and so we can go ahead and compute what those fixed end moments are. And this will be 138.8 kip inches. And that develops at degree of freedom 2 and degree of freedom 6. There are no fixed end shears that develop associated with that. Once we have those fixed end forces for member number two, we need to drop that back into a fixed end force vector for the entire structure. First thing I want to note is that for degree of freedom three and degree of freedom four, that those are not affected by that thermal gradient. So we can go ahead and drop in the 0.0, .0 values we know for those particular degrees of freedom. Then I take those that I found for member number two and I drop them in here as well. The 138.8 kip inches and the negative 138.8 kip inches. And it'll be important that I go ahead and partition this according to the unrestrained degrees of freedom because I'm going to need this vector here which we will call F sub U F E F. So that contains the fixed end forces for the unrestrained degrees of freedom. We can now carry out the matrix operations to find the joint displacements. 
And so we take the inverse of the KUU matrix and multiply it by the F sub U minus the F sub U FEF vector. That's what we are seeing here, which will produce the following values. Negative 0 0.4778 inches and a positive 0 0.0007 ratings. We can jump directly from that into calculating the reactions by using this matrix operation, which is typical for the matrix approach, but we also are going to need to superimpose back the fixed end forces that resulted from that thermal gradient. So we will have those here for the degrees of freedom 3 through 6, and those quantities are 0, 0, 0, and negative 138.8. Performing that matrix operation, I get 3.8 kips, 267.6 kip inches, 6.2 kips, and negative 600.4 kip inches. With the joint displacements and the reactions calculated, I then need to move on to getting the member end forces. And the basic operation there will require the local element stiffness matrix and the end displacements for that particular element. So we get 0 and 0. We read this off of our displacement vectors that we had before. Negative 0 0.4778 and 0 0.0007 radians produces these member end forces of 3.84 kips, 267.6 kip inches, negative 3.84 kips and 286.0 kip inches. So member number one is pretty straightforward, but member number two, we need to do the same type of matrix operation, but then we need to superimpose back what those fixed end forces were. So we've got negative 0 0.4778 inches, 0 0.0007 radians, then we've got zeros here for degrees of freedom 5 and 6. But then we've got the fixed end forces that we had for member number 2. And when I perform those matrix operations, I will then get negative 6.16 kips, negative 286.0 kips, 6.16 kips, and negative 600.4 kip inches. We could, of course, convert those into beam sign convention, but for this example, this will suffice. That concludes this example. As always, it's a beautiful day for studying structures.